go on to parasite, obviously the air uh, carries air from the parasite and also the, like the parenteral, the parenteral uh, signal. So uh, for today's discussion, uh, thanks for everyone to come on the Saturday afternoon and we are very honored to invite two speakers today to join us to talk about the sustainability kind of um, issue and expression design. So today we have Joe Austin, our uh, actually special exhibition design for this exhibition and also architect himself as well, also an educator. So uh, at the very beginning of this, uh, before any discussion, we would have some introduction about actually our current exhibition design of uh, exhibitions. Because like we thought that actually there are a lot of, uh, um, I would say, cross kind of relationship or interdisciplinary kind of discussion in the past about environmental concern and also how art is trying to address it and also uh, but at the pretty uh, often we rely on the artist to address it through their creation or through their uh, presentation but at the same time how maybe art organization or organizer or other stakeholders in the field also play a very key role as well in terms of even at the very uh, uh, earlier on planning stage. So this time actually in our collaboration with Joe, we have like uh, think of a new ways to address this through the spatial design of the exhibition. And so uh, Joe will further talk about it uh, and, and the upcoming um, 15 minutes. And followed by that, we have uh, Roger, Roger Wu, an architect and also a very well-known kind of uh, uh, architect in a lot of different PNLA and other projects as well. And so talk about actually sustainability, we don't want to just address it in terms of the spatial design aspect as well. There are actually a lot of different aspects in terms of not just uh, diving into the material in use or even about, uh, uh, about uh, carbon kind of emission calculation, but actually uh, in terms of talking about waste and all these carbon emission, there are different ways to address it uh, in terms of uh, expression making as well. So how to address it through these uh, different aspects, like I believe Roger will be able to give us some insight in it. So uh, just want to let everyone know that it is a very casual section. We really like to really uh, hear about uh, uh, the intake or like other maybe urgent questions you might have regarding this um, topic. So after maybe the presentation, we will also have some discussion about this and also we very well welcome everyone to join in the discussion and um, to have uh, this, um, um, uh, how we actually can to this topic and also uh, have this collective awareness in this and how to actually um, we are hoping that through this conversation we could address and also uh, how to expand this conversation further so that maybe um, people who, who have joined today in this discussion and also like after uh, afterwards like this will be recorded and on uh, up on our YouTube channel that like people can revisit and also address it in, in their future project as well. So without further uh, delay on anything, I would like to welcome Joe and to first like introduce and give us a better idea about the special design of this exhibition and collaboration as well. And also, um, again, thanks for everyone and the two speakers to join us. Everybody for being here. It's nice to hear that people are interested. Really start with. Uh, and I'd start maybe by framing my engagement with projects. So I'm an architect and recently I've developed an interest in sustainability, like a lot of people I think. Uh, but it's interesting for me to meet the guys at the gallery and to talk about exhibition design because I think they're aware that a lot of exhibition practices are like not so sustainable. There's like a very high turnover, particularly of materials. So like if it's a full practice here at Parasite, in a lot of places it was about building a series of step partitions, having a show for a couple of months and then demolishing that exhibition and taking all those materials away. There's a lot of waste production and I think it's people become more interested in Reducing sustainable design and reducing embodied carbon to kind of thing. Like, this is a, an interesting domain where architects can try and do something new. And I think what's also interesting is that sustainable design or sustainable exhibition making is kind of an entirely undefined thing 
there's like many ways that this can perhaps be done, and there's no like benchmark or what the correct benchmarks, but there's no like definitive way of making a sustainable exhibition. So for me, it, it's nice. This project's been an experiment about thinking about like yes, we want to make a sustainable exhibition or a sustainable show, but like how might we let a particular particular curatorial agenda or a particular cultural agenda like influence that process? So how can we think about like melding these two things together to help define a way of making a sustainable exhibition? Uh, so yeah, we we started saying okay, how can we something more sustainable, particularly how can we produce less waste, and how can that relate to the legacy of the Signals Gallery, which is, is where the curators like all the brief that the curators gave to me, is we want to make a show that relates to the legacy of this like, avant-garde gallery that was in London in the 1960s, and it was a place where like an uh, interesting group of artists allows the sciences and like or ideas from the science and politics to influence their artistic processes and use art as a medium to digest those ideas and share those with other disciplines. So for me this is like a very interesting place to start uh, an architectural design. And then I think, again, it's interesting because Signals isn't just a gallery but it's also a publishing platform, so like a more serious way of so sharing ideas. It, the artists also had a group called the Centre for Advanced Creative Study, which I think in reality is just a group of people in someone's apartment like discussing things, but still it's you know, they tried to frame what they were doing in the same way. Uh, and it was also a collection of artists from all over the world, so there were a few artists from Europe, but also several from South America, some from Asia. So you have people with very different backgrounds and very different ideas coming together to discuss ideas that they thought interesting or important at the time and as some of you might be aware a lot of these artists were like unknown at the time but went on to have very successful and interesting careers uh, so this is a place where David Mandela started his sand machine series so these are a series of artworks that are somehow speculative to the future so it's him saying okay technology is now developing at like a really rapid rate and we're developing new scientific understandings and these will eventually let us transform what we live in in new ways and particularly manipulate landscapes in certain ways. So from my understanding these are like almost like sci-fi speculations of machines that you think will exist and allow us to transform deserts into places of production. So on one hand he's thinking about how is technology changing the, the natural world that we live in. Uh, but also I mean these were interesting at the time because it kind of wasn't in vogue to use uh, kind of unfinished and natural materials that express like the origin of where they come from. So I think they kind of slice them as a place of inspiration. Uh, there was also Lydia Clark, you know, a Brazilian artist. Uh, she was kind of more in the domain of kinetic art, and she did a show of signals which was based around a series of these kinetic sculptures, if we can call them that. And so this is a series of steel plates that are joined by hinges, and you can put them and pick them up. Down, and every time you put them down, they assume a new form. And I think this is her talking about the fact that like, no material object we make is really permanent. Like everything changes or is destroyed or deteriorates in some way. So, how, and her response to this is instead of making a perfect sculpture or object, I would instead make a, a form system that can change over time. And she invited artists, kind of artists but also visitors to the gallery to kind of manipulate these things in the space, so to really relinquish control of the artwork and the space that you can do. Uh, and then there's also Gustav Merzger. So uh, Gustav Merzger was one of the founding members of Signals, but also <coughs> played, or during this time, he played a key role and was perhaps the main protagonist of auto-destructive art and developing and conceptualizing and theorizing a lot of the work taking taking place in the gallery and sharing that with a much more diverse audience. And his his own work relates a lot to process of destruction. I think at the time this was in response to like the aftermath of World War Two, but over the course of his career this changed also to address uh, how our engagement with materials and how processes of building or building artworks perhaps do damage the natural landscapes and how various environmental impacts. Uh, so he was engaged with the arts 
but also uh, with theory and kind of dialogue. And so he organized a symposium uh, about what the digital clock. He wrote a manifesto, and he also presented this manifesto at the AA, uh, an architecture school in London, which at this at the time was like a very fun place for experimental architectural ideas. Um, and the AA, I think, from my understanding, this was a very popular lecture, and the AA later transcribed it and published it in a book, which is things that only in their shot today. So for me, I think this is an example of signals as like an artistic platform, taking ideas from the sciences and perhaps an emerging awareness of climate uh, science, digesting those ideas through like an artistic process or like artistic dialogue, and then sharing them with other disciplines such as architecture and perhaps influencing the way that architects practice and they engage with material cultures. Uh, so the, in the shadow of all of that, uh, the guys came to me and said, can we, uh, can we make a show that builds on the legacy of this gallery? Of course, it's now 2023, not 1962 or three. Uh, and they wanted a show that would have three iterations which I think they had developed in response to these artworks on the idea of things that transform in time, the kinetic art, water destruction, and this kind of thing. Uh, but then, of course, there's this layer of sustainability because, uh, I guess, like a, an awareness of climate, an awareness of sustainable issues, is perhaps one of the most pressing scientific ideas of today. So it's like, okay, this is like, again, one of the curator's responses to to the, the idea of reinterpreting the single show. Um, so uh, we started this process for a number of different reasons, not with like spatial layouts or like perhaps people are cultural ideas uh, in response to the gallery, but also due to the fact that we didn't know what a lot of artworks were when we started the process. So it's like, can you design a show, but we don't know any of the artworks are. So the, this, at the time, was a bit difficult, but for me, in reflection, it was actually, it's a nice trigger, because it means we really started with tectonics and materiality, rather than straight away thinking like, oh, how can we create this, and how can we create a certain environment? So it means we really went back to basics with how do we build something, and particularly how can we build something in a more sustainable way? And the solution that we, I mean, of course, this is a process of exploration, but the solution we eventually arrived at is like a panel system or a series of wooden panels uh, that are held together with just a couple of grease blocks and bolts. So it's the idea of like stripping back a wall to like sort of a collection of very simple elements that are entirely demountable and can be arranged in different ways and therefore hopefully adapt to the artworks as they start to materialize. materialize. Uh, and this yeah, it, it, it's a subset collection of objects that relate to some of the materiality I was talking about in the But also uh, to Hong Kong in some ways. So the breeze blocks, I think, try to address the local context, I know, perhaps like, through a subtle reference to like mid 20th century architecture and the use of the, what was previously a common use of breeze blocks in architecture in Hong Kong. And as some of you might know, breeze blocks are like, I guess, we could call them a climatic, climatically responsive artificial component. They're uh, engaging, you can find it outside somehow. But as uh, air conditioning has become more and more common, these have become less and less common. So it's kind of yeah, a reference to a way of building or a way of thinking about architecture, which perhaps doesn't exist so much in contemporary practice. Uh, uh, and to such an extent that we, we kind of had this idea of using the blocks and all the we had reference, but couldn't find any. So for that reason, I ended up making the blocks that are in the gallery outside. So this, is a, this was for a few reasons. So because we couldn't find them, it also allowed us to use uh, recycled concrete as an aggregate within the, block, within the blocks. And I think for me, the use of concrete. I mean, concrete isn't known for being like a hugely sustainable material. But I mean, I've previously done a bit of research into body carbon, this kind of thing, and concrete, like my body, doesn't actually have a very high body carbon. Like its bad reputation in regards to sustainability is the sheer volume that we're using, and that volume of course adds up and becomes a very unsinkable 
thing. So for me, it was kind of justified to start create A, just to send it accurate. B, because we use a very small amount in a relatively precise way, and that allows us to make a water system or a system, which is the most predominant in the world, but is somehow still very durable and, and survive being kicked every now and then and being rearranged in three different shows. And then it's also a project, like a product, like a brick, that is uh, entirely reusable. Like it's a component that can be shown again and again and again, both for three iterations of this show, but also afterwards. Uh, yeah, so these bricks then join together with a couple of bolts to clamp the wall. Uh, the wall is double-sided. It's, it's a predominantly timber construction. And then, like on a more functional level, these panels can combine in different ways. So I was saying it's like a, a collection of different components. So we have a typical condition where you have a two feet on a panel. You can also have three feet on single panels. And then the panels themselves are made of standardized materials. So we're just com combining like stamped materials. A, because they're readily available. B, because they're uh, and see because it's kind of, you know, a standard sheet which you need to buy, so it's, it's kind of a, a very functional and usable, usable dimension. So yeah, we have one, two, three panels, and you can see it kind of goes on the wall. In the back there, you can also combine the panels to make a video room layout. And then it's also possible to deconstruct this entire thing and use those components to build something else. So, for instance, uh, we wanted a video room that didn't allow uh, light filtration at the bottom, so you can drop the panel down, the brick becomes a counterweight, and the frame is expressed on the outside instead. So, it's just this idea that you know you can have a collection of material elements, and if they're deconstructible, they can be used to make a series of different things, not just saying, you know, a wall has to be here and it's fixed to the ceiling on the floor room. So, it's about adaptability. In, in as many ways as possible. Uh, and then once we had this collection of uh, walls or spatial elements, you can make an arrangement of layouts. And I think maybe this wasn't the intention, but th this ended up being quite useful because we had panels that were resting on feet. In old buildings like this one, the floors are extremely uneven. So when you have when you try and lay like a flat wall, it really doesn't look like but having panels on the feet, we could easily adjust things and we can see the roof normal and not have the accommodate the floor in the same way. Uh, it also means that we can test ideas at like a one-to-one -one scale. So we kind of have a rough idea how a layout might work, but when we're installing, you know, we can lay it out. And if the curators aren't quite comfortable with a, a relationship between two artworks and the visual, we can in situ. And I think like trying to add to the curatorial experience or the way we may show this has been like, quite useful. Uh, but yeah, as once we have this collection of elements, we can make different layouts. So the first one, yeah, was about uh, the first one was about a uh, subdivision. So again, kind of in reference to the the context and also the curatorial ideas, how can we subdivide the gallery with these panels? The second one became about also, so the curatory, the second inspiration of the show was about a passage or a moment of transition. So we focus on this, this idea of a central portal and then the plans do different things to address how it was going to say. And then the third one, which we're going to install next week, is. That's a sneak peek now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No good. It's uh, about a single wall that's somehow deconstructing. So this, this show the shows title here and there. But it's, so it's, a, it's the idea of dispersal, like the wall or the boundary that's breaking down, and that's somehow creating visual dialogue between artworks across that like diffusing threshold. But I think from a, an architectural point of view, uh, it's, it's an idea that you know we make this basic system of panels or a collection of material elements that can do many different things and allow the curators to and myself to work together to create a series of different layouts that are still somehow especially distinct and like interesting. So it's not saying we have one batch of materials to show it's going to look like this, but, but thinking of like a more creative way to say how can we create three or perhaps more very 
different uh, spatial experiences that match the narrative of, of the evolved chapters that were shown, uh, but while using the same material. And then, uh, and then, yeah, I think it, it's important also to address that, you know, this, you have these ideas that everything can be implemented in this world and stuff, and there are, of course, limitations to this. And I think uh, there are moments where, like, a particular artwork or an artist, you know, really needs, like, a colored background, so we have to paint it all, and therefore, you know, somehow limit it to really or we have the man of the TV panel, and therefore we need lots of cables. So there are, of course, like moments of compromise, and I, and I think we, we try and accept that to a certain extent. And where we have to do that kind of thing, it's on a wooden panel, you know, wood being out of the music and it's still as recyclable and, and replaceable. But I think for me, you know, this has been like a learning experience, perhaps, of like learning like what creators need and what artists need and how that might complement the system in the agenda. And I think it's it's also something that like moving forward I anticipate that I but perhaps all of us to some extent will have to learn to uh, to balance. To like like obviously the most sustainable thing you can do is now but at the end of the day, you know, we want to make an art show and we want to contribute to a cultural discussion and achieve different things. So it's about for me this has been like a case study or a, like an experiment in like how, how can we balance those processes or like how can I as a spatial designer try and add to like the curatorial narrative that, this, that the curators are trying to develop whilst also I think the system of the agenda. Yeah, I think it's something we're we'll all learning to do better in the future. And that's me. Yeah, thank you so much Joe for like really like what you know what you have been in the past like chapters and sneaking on the chapter three as well. Like as like Joe just mentioned, it is a very experimental kind of practice for us how we work with social designer as well. As like he mentioned as well, very often we already in the past practice we have a set of uh, artwork there like proximity about like how they display presentation by very specific cut requests and how we use the spatial design to accommodate it sometimes and or also like you know virtual practice how the journey will evolve and how actually the spatial design will talk in the same language as well but this time because we have these th three different chapters and we don't actually know maybe the second or third chapter how words will evolve at the very beginning as well and this actually this re reusable recycle readaptable kind of uh, display actually really give us this flexibility and like like keep us like motivated as in like oh we don't have to decide it now but actually we can adjust like at the situation and give us this flexibility which is very appreciated it's also like i'm shooting myself in the foot because these guys then hold off on making decisions that he is so we can't finalize plan until the day before the shift but that's why we do yes very appreciative on this like yeah very last minute that just would require as well so yeah it has been a great journey and i hope you guys can see like as you can see earlier in the slide as well like like it, it is actually really reusing the same kind of structure and display and how it could has this like so different change across this short period of time and really speak to theme as well so it actually the spatial design really accelerated as in our curatorial kind of uh, direction of practice for for the exhibition as well so um yeah so thank you very much for joe and also for the next um two minutes we have roger to really share with us like as i mentioned earlier apart from really addressing sustainability in terms of spatial design and material like material wise like what we chose to use or like how we are going to manage waste like they are actually beyond this aspect more than that in terms of the planning stage and also how to evaluate it as well so i'm very looking forward to like roger's kind of input in it because like i would say like zero kind of carbon emission has been like always like 
resurfacing in different kind of discussion topics uh, on many institutions or practice, but how to actually incorporate in an exhibition, I think it was it has a very good example that you did at the uh, Shenzhen kind of called like BNL kind of situation. So, thank you, Roger, for sharing this project with us. Thank you. Um, I have to two, make two declarations. First of all, um, I can see there are a lot of architects here. I mean, architects is a breed of people who are very strange. You know, we're very protective of our title, so nobody who's not an architect can't be called an architect. And here we are calling myself a curator, and I have no curatorial training, and I just happen I'm an accidental curator, and I happen to have curated a few things. So, 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 and secondly, I don't have all the answers. Don't, I mean, I think I've, I've, uh, ever since this particular exercise, I have curated an exhibition that's traveled to Shenzhen, uh, no, sorry, it's traveled to Hangzhou, Beijing, Shanghai, New York, and Hong Kong. Very unsustainable in a kind of, you know, that sort of sense. Um, the last exhibition I've done um, was about fashion, couldn't be more unsustainable in, in industry. Um, but I've learned a few things, and, 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 and it's got kind of um, worked into the exhibition, and I've got something out of it, but there are things I could have done better. And uh, um, I'm, I'm curating an exhibition now, and Zoe and I were there in, in Macau, and, 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 and um, the overall uh, Biennale, not the bit that I was doing, it couldn't be as, you know, being in Macau couldn't be as unsustainable as it can be. So, so I don't have all the answers, but I want to introduce this particular one to you. Um, before I go into it, I think it's a good story to tell in that I, I you know, I was, I was a co-curator of the, the UAB, the um, Hong Kong Biennale of Urbanism and Architecture, 2015. Um, I was under a chief curator from, from um, Christine Bordy. She was the chief curator, a well-known kind of educator in the UK, architect. Um, there were things that I wanted to do, you know, I, I, you know there, there, I just couldn't, you know. And, I would, and, and there was the opportunity came in 2019 for me to do as chief curator. I said, good, I'll do that the way I want to do it, so I did it. And um, at that time, there was a lot of pressure for anybody to talk about, but still now, to talk about uh, sustainability, right? So, and I was always very embarrassed about it because I'm not an expert on sustainability, and any sustainable, any talk on sustainability, you talk about it today, tomorrow it will be old news. It will be somebody has come up with a different way of looking at it, and 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 so on and so forth. So I was always very very kind of oh, I don't really want to do another symposium about architecture and and and, and, and sustainability, and I just I, I just couldn't bring myself to do it, and I was holding back, holding back, holding back. Um. The, the planning stage already started, and then there was this opportunity. Somebody said, well, there's a sponsor who's really into sustainability. Um, try and get some sponsorship and do something about it. And I, I scratched my head, you know, you, at yours do, you do some ex, ex, you know, uh, research. And, well, that sponsor, they're really into food waste. And I scratched my head a long time, said, I can't bring that together to my exhibition. So I thought, okay, I'll just do what I think I should do. So this do sustainability. So I said, if I don't get it, I don't get it. I would much rather go that way than try and make my, you know, change the topic of my BNRA into to, to connect with food, food waste. And then I thought, well, what to do? And I did, I said, well, it's a, it's a very brave thing for the client, for, 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 for the um, uh, 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 sponsor, because I said, look, we couldn't find anybody who's done a sustainability study on the on exhibitions itself. So we, we thought, well, why don't we look at our Footprint. Everybody know this waste, etc. Sort of so how bad is it? So we commissioned um, Stinson Barney with a sponsorship to do a study from first principle, i.e., from the planning stage to the making stage to the exhibition stage to the to the dismantle stage. What is the footprint? Now, the Hong Kong Institute of Architects Biennale Foundation was very kind because it could be very ugly. But could you imagine? You say, well, uh, we caused hundreds of tons of footprint. So what do you do? So we actually siphoned some of the sponsorship off to say, look, at the end, it doesn't matter how much it is, we'll at least do some carbon credit, you know, carbon offsetting. So, so there is a bit of a story to tell, but we have no idea how big it was, because there was, nobody's done anything like that. The only closest thing that we found were people like NBA, you know, for their corporate social responsibility, they have to say, well, you know, you know it is how much, how much, and so on. But it's not open source. So we don't know how much it would, you know, how they come about doing this. So is that once you've done this, this has to be open source. 
So if somebody else wants to do this, you can use the, the way that we calculated it and do it again. And that, and that way, you get a lot more data. You know, and that was the whole idea. You know, we, it's not ours. You know, we want people to come and do it. So, so we did that. So I mean, this is all text, but basically, it is an exhibition that was held in the mills, and we uh, over three months period. We had about 60 exhibits, and we had a lot of different kind of uh, things. So at the end, so just hold it. At the end, we, we calculated. You know, we had 85,200 um, uh, 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 units of CO2. So how big is it? So basically, we kind of equated it to, you know, how many bowls of rice you have to eat. So, so people can get a sense of, you know, what it means. And, and, but, but still, the figure doesn't really mean anything. So what do we do with that figure? And how does it break down is, is, is important. So, so what we did was that, uh, um, well, so how do we get that figure first? Um, basically, in one of the exhibits at the end, actually, if you haven't seen it, have a look at it. It's a, it's a UK architect called Fielding Clark Bradley. They're one of the very first architectural firms who's really into environmental issues. They did, about a few years ago, they did an exhibition called Carbon Count. Basically, is explaining what one kilogram of carbon means in terms of materials. What does it mean in aluminium? What does it mean in timber? And that was a great exhibition. So we brought it in Hong Kong electronically. And at the end, there was an interactive panel. So it asks you questions like where you come from. And it asks you questions. And then it tells you know, uh, you know, different modes of transport, but where you come from, how you, you know, different modes of transport. And then it calculates, you know, sort of um, tells you what the average kind of uh, footprint is. And then it also, it's interesting. We learned something. The MTR is the most efficient. And then it's more efficient in cycling. I mean, in Hong Kong, but that was, you wouldn't, if you have a death wish, you will cycle. But um, <laughs> even if you cycle, it's twice as much as you take the MTR. It's surprising, mm -hmm. but because you've got to eat, you've got to replenish your energy and so on and so forth. So, but MTR is it's, it's kind of an economy of scale and so on. And the most, uh, sorry, uh, the ferry is the worst. You know, we, we live in a, a place where there are sort of like islands, thousands or hundreds of thousands of islands, hundreds of islands, and it's, a, it's very interesting. So, so we did that, so encourage people to engage and so on. So we collected all the data, uh, and then we analyzed it, and it's all broken down. But what was quite interesting was that transport is the worst culprit. Now, the exhibition is in the middle of Hong Kong, geographically, in Chin Wan, right? So everybody travel there. Um, which my I don't know because we don't have enough data. I would like to see what happens if the exhibition was in central, because people would go there after work. So they might not have, you know, when they did that, they say, "Where do you travel from?" I travel from central. So so blah blah blah. So in a way, I can't change history. We've done what, I, but it would be interesting to see if we have enough data. Where right from the outset, when you plan an exhibition, the location of the exhibition, the impact of it, to in terms of carbon footprint. Now, we were lucky because we were in the pandemic mode. We didn't fly anybody. Could you imagine if we had to fly speakers on? That would have gone through the roof. So, so, but even so, transport is so much more. And look at, you know, I mean, this is here uh, for flights, but if we had to fly people with that, it would have gone through absolutely the roof. You know, the events are very little. The exhibitions is actually not. Now, it was a third, it was, to put it into context, a three month exhibition with about 200,000 people. Visited. Two hundred thousand. Yeah, right. Okay, something. Like that. So, yeah. So, um, so we did that. We learned a huge amount out of it. You know, we say, okay, next. Um, and then what we did, we said, uh, well, actually, what next? Because, it, as I said, it could be very ugly. What's eighty-two thousand? What you know, kilometers, you know, kilograms of you know. You know, it, for, for Hong Kong IA um, Biennale Foundation, they said, well, you know, we've caused that much. So, but, but actually, if you are too embarrassed about that, what you do is that you say, well, I won't, I won't tell anybody in the first year, but I made a plan. If I were to run the same exhibition next time, I would do a number of these things. We, we've actually come up with a plan to do the same thing that will give you 50% reduction. So you tell the world next time. So actually, Guess what? We've actually reduced that footprint by 50%. It's an altogether much more positive message. So, so that's how I actually sold it to them. And say, well, you know, you don't have to say tell the world the first time, you tell the world the next time when we reduce it. So that was very useful because we, 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 we because by the time we got the sponsorship on board, we were, we've already started a motion of 
well, Anthony was one of the exhibits, so exhibitors, so he, who know that we actually sent him a, a questionnaire, said, how did you design it? Uh, how much material you used? And where did the material come from? So it all got fed into the, the, the calculations. Next. I'm going to put you on the spot in a minute. Uh, so, so, so again, you know, here we, we, we looked at, you know, sort of the eight components of it. This is the exhibition part of it. And, and you can see that for exhibition part, 85%, 85 percent, 85 percent almost is the transportation. So location, location, location is probably, but, but this is kind of paradoxical because, you know, Hong Kong what is great at, you know, the convention center, the expos and so on. Actually, the waste is probably the least of our worries. It's people coming to the exhibitions, coming to the conferences. That's the big, big, biggest issue. And if you look at here, um, you know, for, you know, we, we did, you know, so no flights. So this is what happened it, it pretty much when we did our um, no flight uh, uh, version. And this is the rift flight, projected rift flight version, if we were to do our events um, with, now obviously after the pandemic, we don't fly as much, so that was great. Now, this is very interesting. So we did a leak table of all the 60 exhibits. Where's yours? No, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so these are the least kind of carbon footprint, worst, right? I thought there was going to be a bun fight between the exhibits. I said, no, mine is better, mine is better, mine, mine could be right at the bottom, so on, so on. But there was, there was very little of that. Now, but even looking at that, that's kind of, kind of interesting. This group is a, is also quite ironic. The, the, the worst case, guess what the title is? Look, Generating Greener Cities. <laughs> now, okay, we, we looked at that. We said, look, the green bar is the worst culprit in that. Why is that? They had this idea of passing on a message using a lot of digital media. The exhibition ran for three months to every day from nine to 10. So that was a problem. Now we all thought, well, no way, so 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 digital. But you know, I can't find it. Look, I mean, it was in the mills. Well, actually, I can't find any look any any exhibition venues which uses sustainable fuel, sustainable energy, you know, uh, 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 renewable energy. So just think about it. Just project this. If if for some strange reason we manage to get the convention center to get renewable energy from the grid all the way through, it would be a fantastic opportunity to say this is the one in the first in the world that use, you know, that get rid of all of that green bar for all exhibits. It's, 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 it's a marketing opportunity for, 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 you know, for the likes of exhibitors, exhibition venues, and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, the two electric company, the two providers are a long way off of giving us sustainable fuel. Um, in, in a way, this, I mean, I digress, but this is the way that the government is approaching it because, you know, we have 60 odd percent of um, waste from the industrial, um, the sort of construction waste uh, uh, footprint, which is from the construction industry, 67 percent, um, about 18 percent is from car, uh, 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 the transport. And the government's view is that, well, if we get the two electric company to get all the electricity from renewable sources, and then all the cars are electric, then we can solve 80 percent of our, you know, uh, 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 carbon footprint. But that's kind of, isn't it, the sort of efficiency paradox? So you, you kind of make it efficient, and therefore people use more of it, and then you're going to cause some some other problem somewhere else. And I think I think that's a, you know, it, it just kind of reflects some very very interesting ideas here. So, uh, have you found yours yet? I have two books in there. Is it right at the top? Uh, I, I, middle. I, I found mine too. You find this? Let me let me up there. Good. Well, I'm glad <laughs> you're reacting to it now. Next, yes, please. So, what did we do? Well. So at the end, we, I, and I said, I set, up, I, I set aside some money for, for carbon offsetting. At, at the beginning, we really didn't have any idea how much it was. So thanks to pandemic, thanks to also the point that we, we, we were lucky in that by the time we, we started doing this, we've already designed the, the, um, the display stands and so on and so forth. But we were, and again, we were lucky because we were hosting in the mills, which was actually one of the very first time that uh, a Biennale was held in a, semi kind of private shopping mall environment. And before we finished, a lot of the shoppers, a lot of shopkeepers said, can we have your stands afterwards? So immediately we cut half of our waste. So it actually inspired me for my last exhibition in near 
designed their D2 plates, right? We designed specifically so that people could take the stands away if they wanted to. So in a way, although I, you know, as I said, you know, it doesn't, I didn't carry out the study again, but I think it sort of sparked some sort of ideas about how you kind of move it forward. And we were very, very lucky that the money we, 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 we put aside, we didn't even use all of it. And the exhibition was six times carbon positive. So we managed to get the carbon credit six times the amount that we actually, the carbon that we actually spent. Now, it sounds like a great thing, right? But you see, apart from that leak chart, nobody really challenged it. Nobody really challenged our methods. I want people to challenge our method if I got it right, because that's not the only way to calculate it. I'm absolutely sure. But unfortunately, nobody challenged that either. And, and, and in a way, I, I would like to see that, you know, people challenge the idea. You know, I, I mean, can it be really six times possible? Have we missed out something? I mean, we, we were. I mean, the guy, um, uh, uh, we, we were hoping that we would get sort of a lot of questions we did. But in the end, when we were looking for, that was like four years ago, when we were looking for carbon credit to buy in Hong Kong, unfortunately, we couldn't find the right ones. You, can you show the next two? We, we bought three, and, and all together, these three, you know, so, so you see we bought 201 credits for this particular certification, we bought 100 certificate uh, units here, and then we bought another one off somewhere. Um, they all calculated differently. But one thing, we, one thing what we really, really wanted to do was to do something which is local, because these funds all go to offshore different places for the sustainable um, projects. That was four or five years ago. I'm pleased to say that CLP now offer carbon credit, which actually pumps back into local projects. So there is progress. Okay. Thank you. Next, um, I think this is it. Now, one of the things that I know, which you know, I, I, I've done. I mean, I'm really happy that I've done this project, and I think I was hoping at that point, about four years ago, it was a little step, and I really wanted other people to kind of you know try and do likewise, and and so on and so forth to know of it. And I was just about to get give up and then and then I got a phone call from them. Say that uh, in fact it was it was you were just searching on the internet and then you came across it. So I'm very yeah, pleased. It was sustainable design on, on sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I don't you know but I don't have all the answers. But I, I like to think that you know there are more way more more than one ways of thinking about it. I mean obviously the, the use of materials is important but that then you put it into the bigger context. And, and one of the things, are two things, which is not, nothing to do with the, the report itself, but sort of kind of further thinking, there are two points, which I think is very important for exhibition designers, art shows, and so on and so forth. The first is the idea that um, uh, how do you balance, now, because because the, 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 the bad boy, the worst case, the generating greener cities, Maybe it's justifiable because maybe 100 people who saw that show, saw that exhibit, actually changed their lifestyle and become a much more kind of, you know, led a much more sustainable lifestyle. How do you calculate that social impact versus the more kind of, meth, you know, more kind of tangible carbon footprint? And, and that's one area that I really want to explore because, because let's face it, whatever we do, every single exhibit, everything we do, there is a footprint. We cannot get away from that. But how can you balance the impact of what you're telling, what you're trying to educate people, or the message? That, for me, is a much more difficult thing to measure because you've got to measure what it is before and what it is after, and there's no guarantee that that, that measurement is it, it's, it's a projection. But but then I, I look back, and, I, and I, as I said, you know, then after this one, I, I, I spoke with in 2024, to um, exhibition, uh, the, the Biennale curators, I tried to get them to, to, to use the open source to do this exercise, at least kind of get a progression for a number of reasons. I mean, they still take a lot of resources to do it, so they didn't do it. But, and I'm pleased, really pleased that they approached it a completely different way. You know, they, they, they chose a location which was, which was it's, there's no air conditioning, which is semi outdoors, but, you know, very, very well ventilated and so on. So, so in a way, you know, I kind of said, okay, fine. I think, I think, at least that conversation, there are various people doing different things to, to, to kind of, you know, try and try and push that conversation forward. So, so one is a study, and the other is don't be too precious. I think, you know, I mean, I was, I probably was a bit immediately after this study, I was way too precious about trying to get people to say, look, you know, sort of, you know, you 
you've got to look at it like that. Right. But you know, there, there are many, many different ways of looking at it. So that's it. Thank you very much, Brent. Yeah, I think like we have always like been in like in our discussion talking about like how do we define sustainable kind of like practice. Like as you just mentioned, like even you have a, a clear methodology how to calculate it and how to put it into like a quantifying kind of like measurable and like people can actually see the impact, etc. But actually these are still kept up for challenge and but like the most important thing is like what it opens up the opportunity for this discussion and for these conversations to happen. I think that is the important thing that these are the reference points that people can take as a reference to further discussion and expand our understanding of what can be done. So that's why I think like I really want to ask a question as in like for both of your practice, like as in what's the most maybe urgent or like more like missing part that people always neglect in terms of like uh, when they are uh, thinking about exhibition making or exhibition design. Because like I think Roger earlier on like addressed as well as in like the transportation part actually was even the emission is even more than way more than the exhibition itself. That was an eye opening for me when I was like reading this report like when he shared with me and about the operational kind of like impact as well as in the daily for example, for our, our exhibition making, actually we spend our resources and material actually on the maintenance or conservation because of the aircon, humidity level, and all these. Actually, it's not entirely related to the exhibition design or even exhibition making. But actually, these has to be taken into consider consideration and calculation or like thinking. So how do we, in your kind of opinion, like what are the other more most neglected kind of aspect or area, you think? I mean, just I mean, it's taking inspiration from, 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 from your talk, one thing that spring, came to mind was the fact that you mentioned the auto-destructive art. Right? You see, for me, I think, I think the preciousness of the piece of artwork is interesting. You mentioned the air conditioning and humidity. You know, think about an auto-destructive piece of art. You know, it's not going to be here for hundreds of years. The fact that it's deteriorating, it's decaying, or even destructing, means that it, the environment will be different, right? And, and as I said, in the 2022 PMRL, they've actually chosen venues, which potentially cost out the, the exhibits, but they designed the exhibition around that. And I think, I think that preciousness about the exhibit, and, I mean, I remember t a t a, a, a Anthony's piece, you know, he allowed people to play with it. You know, it, it's not you know you know that that pinball game thing, and in a way, I think I think the the process of the artwork you exhibit, and therefore its requirement for 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 how it was displayed, needs ought to be much more kind of connected with the environment. You know, Hong Kong is not a great place for for displaying artwork which needs to be air conditioned twenty four hours and humidity. I mean, it's, it's just you know, I mean, I think I think that for me is you know it's it's an issue. I mean, that that me to. One, another point which is very interesting about the exhibition is that a lot of times when we choose exhibits, particularly for the Biennale and things like that, so architecture and urbanism, we chose according to originality. But at the end, when we were calculating the, the, the carbon footprint of the exhibits, we, we actually said, okay, is your exhibit going to be exhibited somewhere else? Because by theory, if it was, we could halve the carbon footprint shared with the next place where it was going to be exhibited. So if you go back, well, we almost immediately cut out all those exhibits who's, which has been exhibited before, if originality was such a big deal. So in future exhibition planning, is there a way to kind of balance that in terms of, you know, things which has been displayed before or it has a life afterwards? You know, obviously you need to kind of tweak it or you need to kind of adapt it in order to, to be suitable for a particular show. And these are immensely interesting point, much more interesting point to discuss than the actual carbon footprint itself, together with the idea of how you balance that with a social impact. You know, the whole idea about the East East Vision art or, or whatever, is about education. And how do you measure that? Again, you know, that for me would be, uh, 
10 PhD degrees. <laughs> Just a quick response to that. Like, I totally agree with, like, the maintenance part of it count, like, mostly on the exhibit itself and the material and all these, like, rules that govern it. Because, like, for example, especially for museum, definitely they are adhere to very, really strict kind of rules, as in, like, the, the temperature level the humidity level and like like what the conservator there are always this like balance or like continuous discussion in between conservator and curator and artist like how to balance it out in between for the sake of the art but like how about for the sake of the environment how about for the sake of the wider course like how do we take that into account as well that is for a more more urgent question and one very interesting thing i just want to quickly mention is like during the pandemic time actually a lot of museum revisiting their conservation rules and actually decide certain exhibit do not actually need to maintain that level of humidity do not need to remain that level of temperature and decide that they going forward I'm not going to keep them into this restriction so that they don't need to turn on the aircon for this part of the exhibit. And that's why it's interesting for me how pandemic actually has an impact, not just because of the kind of uh, economic kind of impact on this uh, museum, but actually trigger them to rethink about environmental wise, not just because the save on energy costs, but actually like they're revisiting their practice, they're revisiting their Rules. And that is very, um, I think, interesting for me to actually like going forward to like how to open up this discussion further as well. Yes, so Joe, any yeah, insight? I, I think uh, I think, well, for, for me, like from a more design perspective, I think it's, it's an open risk fundamental thing. I think it's just like a material awareness or, or just to constantly be conscious that you're like making material decisions and like the impact of this. So I think we did it with this show, particularly because of the narrative of the show and like to applaud the gallery for like really like starting this initiative and making it like part of the design brief. So so it kind of like forced us to really engage with it. So so I think that was very positive. I think but yeah it's it's an attitude to materials and like the reusability of the materials. And I think there's a few architects at the moment who kind of proclaim that we, we've already produced all the building materials we need in the world. Like, that we, we have enough material to accommodate human education. It's just our ability to reuse. Like, we don't need to continuously extract. And it's, I think it's kind of up to designers and architects as much as possible to, to build that into the practice. It's just the default isn't to use a new product, but it's somehow to, to, re, to design for reuse. And I think it's also interesting what Roger mentioned about the auto destructive art because, I mean, I've, we've had conversations here kind of with the team about, you know, I think we know for the art gallery that like flying in artworks from across the world maybe is kind of something we try not to talk about. So, but we do. But then I think in this show it's interesting there's, there's been a few works of artists who have used their old work, like responding to the narrative of the show. There's also Gislin's work, which is like an instruction-based art piece. So we've engaged like a, an international artist and they've provided instructions and we've had art and this were painted the piece around the wall. So it's like, we've been able to engage an art piece that was produced by an international artist somewhere else, but produce it locally. And I think, I'm not saying that like all artwork should be like this, but perhaps there's a percentage that can like this and help us in some way so just think yeah just have an awareness of what it takes either to make make the materiality of something or to transport it somewhere else it just happens that that um again not very environmentally friendly um, one of my next projects is to take some designers to the dutch design week and take some work to the dutch design week, so it involves a lot of traveling but there is a kind of upside to it because um the dutch design week is very big on circular design. So, so it's actually forcing us to think about circular design in, in the sense that just thinking about what you're talking about, the materiality in terms of the maintenance. Now, you know, if you think about it in a very circular kind of way, what, what happens is, what, what if we put some resources into the materiality of the artwork? 
pigment that doesn't react to humidity or UV light as much as others of canvas or materials. That's circularity. You know, you're talking about the, the, the source of the thing. So, so then uh, downstream, you don't need to have that sort of maintenance as much as you would otherwise and so on. And what about storage? You know, you know, these days, people, I've just been to Iceland, people are building kind of a, a data centers in Iceland because the climate, you don't need so much cooling. Now, you know, what, how does it balance in transportation of artwork, you know, and, and so on. These needs to be studied. And on top of that, what happens if you kind of, um, you know, the idea of, you know, uh, some, the idea of cross fertilization of ideas of designing, which makes something that happens in this climate, but not so well in other climates. These won't happen if you kind of make these, you know, it's like the COP26 kind of syndrome, you know, it, you know, you know when, they, when, when, when President Biden went to Scotland, you know, he took 26 of his motorcade to talk about climate change. You know, how ridiculous is that? But, but, but there's no, no thing, that, but there isn't a standard saying that, well, you know, you change people's thinking and therefore you allow 14 motorcades, 14 cars in motorcade. You know, it isn't actually like that, but it is about this idea of thinking about the circularity of things from, 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 from cradle to, you know, from, from dust to dust. The idea that, that, that there's no one thing that solves that problem. You know, because one thing that I always thought was potentially uh, 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 not solve the problem is that, you know, what, what if there is, there is a commitment for a certain group of a collective a gallery to say, look, we will, we will um, commit a certain amount of the budget for a, 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 each exhibit to put into a pot for a, a carbon credit. And a carbon credit, um, we, we collaborate with a certain carbon credit provider or green finance specialist to put that fund in back into the art world to do all these projects about materiality, about stories. That, for me, is a kind of a very circular way of thinking about the problem. I mean, not, not all, none of us, plus one person, can solve the problem. But collectively with the lawyers, collectively with, with, with politicians, collectively with accountants, we can solve it. Yeah. I totally agree. Like there are a lot of stakeholders in it beyond the art world, like beyond like our colleagues and friends. And also like I think another angle of seeing it as well, I think we discussed it before as well, as in like people think that being uh trying to go for sustainable sustainable practice is always a reduced method. It's always a method with boundary, with restriction, with constraint constraints that it doesn't uh, it doesn't make sense to pair it with art. It doesn't make sense to pair it with design. It doesn't make sense to pair it with creativity. But actually, what this sustainable way of doing is actually another creative kind of problem and have creative kind of uh, rules that help people to think around it and think about the possibility and opportunity and so on. And as in like, it is we are trying to maximize the, the the use of the material or maximize the lifespan of it and also how it add values to the society and how it is an add value re like versus reduce kind of method. So anything like would like to add as well like on this thinking? Yeah, I think, well I mean I mean at least in this show I think for us yeah that idea of embracing sustainability is something that helps you define a narrative and decide and define like a or it might be like a design approach it, this show allowed us to create a different aesthetic i think it's like when we started we didn't know what we wanted the show to look like or exactly how it would function but in the end like allowing this this idea of something to, to like infiltrate our pool of influences and the creative process yeah, produced a new, at least for me, or is a new aesthetic. I mean, whether people like that or not, of course, it's entirely subjective, but at least it's something that we wouldn't have done otherwise. So I think that's an example, yeah, of sustainability, like aiding a cultural process or helping to create a new cultural process rather than like, limiting something. But I think you're entirely right that in architecture is often, I think like in standard architecture context at least, at the moment, it's often like post a lot of people post rationalize. It's like kind of do what you were doing before and somehow post rationalize to this kind of sustainable 
or there's like an eye roll moment, like after you've designed something and it's like, can't use this, can't use this material, you can't have a giant cantilever and this kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, like embracing it at the start and like from the outset saying, okay, this is going to be an inspiration rather than something that restrains you later on. I mean, I like the idea of of, of, of the um, funk because I mean, the way one of the you know you could imagine it using materials locally, you know, it it it, it it's, it's kind of it, in itself it is an exhibit. So 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 all the the panels, you know, you could different different cultures have different ways of you know, making things, and I think the display could could well be part of that statement. Uh, you know, it's being you know, it might be different. In, South America than it is in Europe, and so talking which I there was sorry I just something something came to mind it, it's a bit, bit of an anecdote I mean uh, uh, on architecture uh, it's not we not really kind of related to this um, we, we we were we were when I was in working in the UK we were working on a revitalization project of a Frank White Wright building in, in, in Florida some college and then we were we were they were all the concrete sort of really or make concrete blocks sort of decay. So we used um, the engineer was doing a, a analysis whether there was a climatic thing because it was very it was it was in um, Lakeland, very humid. And and so 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 we wondering why is it and then whether we were using materials at the time which was different that it could be much more sustainable now and so on. And then there was this chemical makeup which they couldn't understand where it came from. Right? So we scratched out with absolutely no answer but we, we, we looked through the archive and we looked through, it was right towards the, the end of Frank Lockwood's uh, 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 before he passed away and, and he was he was working with Florida Southern College almost on a pro bono basis and some of the buildings were built by the students and you've got these really match you know, guys you know, doing this and uh, that was done. And then we came up with a theory which was you know, not unofficial. Basically, it was kind of um, Maryland, the campus was in the middle of nowhere and there was no facilities, they were using students to build here in the middle of summer, very humid and so on. And they drank a lot of water and they in the mix of the concrete. And that's why it's got that really high concentrator of whatever chemical and it eroded the eroded. Now that was that's not official, but it was a very nice story to tell. Anyway, that reminded me that that we were essentially making those those breaks. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for that story. Like, <laughs> I need to Google it. I need you, you, to check into my study. So yeah, as I think as Jim just mentioned, like actually there are always like when in the past in my experience in exhibition of King, like we always try to really think about how to build the scenographic kind of experience, atmospheric experience of exhibition. And that like we keep on thinking how to change the color, how to change the use of material, curtain, soft, hard material, how to make a tunnel, make a house or other to make people go into that like, uh, uh, that uh, connection with the artwork, how to create that atmosphere. But actually like this time, the, to the approach is totally different, but actually this is uh, also a challenge to how we see the white space or white wall in a gallery space or in an art space as well, which is very the kind of DNA of the parasite as well, as in that we don't re relate this to these like really conventional way of exhibiting. So it has been really a great journey like to work with Joe and also like different architects to talk about this. So I really want to open up this discussion with uh, our audience as well, because I, I felt like there are so many diff diff like colleagues or like friends from uh, different discipline as well. So it would be great to also hear like if you have any urgent question or any thoughts or sh wants to share with us as well, please feel free. Thank you, both uh, Joel and Roger, for the presentation. Great. I have a question for maybe more Joel and, and Parasite. Um, I think you've touched on this a, a little bit already. I'm curious about the um, process between the designer and the curators, whether the theme of sustainability came out of the designer or you know, was it a, 
a result of the process of collaboration or has it always been, you know, a recurring theme in Paris? I apologize, not very familiar with the space. Um, because what was most striking to me was, you know, the series of diagrams that, that you showed, the phase one, two, and three. But the, the most striking thing to me was the tabula rasa site condition was shown at the very end instead of the beginning, right? Usually architects showed in the beginning. What, and that caught, really caught my attention, I really like that. So maybe you could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, I think the idea of showing the empty gallery, it, it was always this idea that we, we're doing something temporary. I, I'm going to start with it. So, so yeah, it, it's, it's the idea that you know, we, we know it's going to be temporary, we know we're going to start with this ambition, we know we're going to end with this ambition. So, so yeah, and then that, that kind of defines like our approach to materials and thinking about how things are used. And so we designed, I mean, the show, just to give people aware, is unusual in the sense that it's a show, but it's actually three shows. So it's, I mean, therefore it has a duration of six months, which for Paris it was a very long period of time. So we try and, yeah, say like, how can we be six months old and minimize our waste? But also, like, we minimize our waste, but I think we're also continuing discussions how we can use literally those same material elements outside after this also. So we're gonna leave the empty gallery, but we're kind of, as much as possible, taking materials with us to do other projects, potentially. So I think this is like an attitude, which is, I mean, I appreciate and comes largely from Paris in terms. And to answer the first part of the question, no, it really comes from the gallery. I mean, like, I have an interest in sustainability before we started working together. It's something that I've, like, studied a little bit. And I think this helped us to, like, form a relationship in the first place. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Celia, but my understanding is, Paris said recently, you have a new director, Billy, who's fortunately in here today, and as part of his statement, or, I don't know, he says things when he arrives, and, and part of that was, Paris said it's going to be more sustainable, and he wanted to, uh, he wanted to address that in his first show, which was in collaboration with Celia, so this is in the group from day one. It's like, they say to me, okay, we know you're interested in this, we're interested in this, like, what can we do? So, yeah. so, like, similar to what Joe just mentioned, like, sustainable kind of, like, kind of uh, direction of how we approach the special design for especially this exhibition. Of course, it's not the first time that we are trying to address this, actually. We have done other exhibition in the past that we think about how to actually make reusable kind of uh, structure or talking with special designer and think about it uh, in other various projects as well. But uh, I would say that in the past it wasn't so successful in some <laughs> way, um, as in like where the uh, actually the design kind of structure can be retained and really re recyclable and reusable. Or re Adaptable. Uh, we always try to think about like whether some material can have a second life and or how to reuse it at a subsequent exhibition. I would say like this has always been in our discussion when we plan the exhibition or when we plan a project. But actually, how to put it into action, we need these like knowledge and experience from different uh, background people as well. Like we cannot really achieve it without special designer without our construction director or without other fabricator to be on board to really discuss this with us. Because like, to be honest, to make a structure, to to change the whole atmospheric kind of uh, wall, module and etc. It's not that difficult. Like there are so many designs. Like we were in our exchange, we were having all these like exchange about these references in the past, like what has been done as a practice. But actually, like what would make sense at this site, what what would make sense in this project? It it, it still need these like uh, critical thinking or like to streamline it into its core kind of like material, to, in order to make it happen. So yeah, then um that's why like I was saying like it it has been quite successful for the moment for for to achieve I would say like what we have set up in in the very beginning that how actually the structure could actually change across the 
exhibition and actually how it could respond to the theme as well. Because like, let me just quickly say some boring, maybe curatorial kind of thematic for each chapter. Actually, like for um, for the first chapter, it was more addressing the politics of space about like um, how the scarcity of space that like we in Hong Kong like how to respond to it. Like very often there's these subdivided flat situation and how rooms are divided into smaller kind of in order to cater to a different purpose. So that's why like actually um, this structure, uh, this uh, spatial design can respond to how the space can be defined. And then going to the second kind of theme of like the exhibition, it was more talking about time and space, the liminal kind of uh, of fluidity about like uh, a non-linear definition of time and space, how we create these passageway or pathway or like this in-between kind of uh, 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 space for people to connect work together. That's why we have opened it up and create this like longer kind of uh, pass passage for people to explore in the second chapter. So, um, and then the next chapter, because it was responding to the dispersed kind of topic we set off for chapter three, how uh, the migratory kind of flow or population, how it it can be reflected in terms of how we reconnected with the wider world of Hong Kong and lens, and also like how this dispersed uh, diaspora community, how do we stay connected? That's why there are a lot of like uh, artwork include are responding to it and how actually the spatial design can respond to it as well and add narrative to it as well, which is. The read I have is actually, you know, we could do all the infrastructure and so on, but what is the art response? I mean, I know, I know, I know, I know, because I mean, I'm looking at uh, Carolyn, because she's looking, thinking of something like that. Uh, you know, what's art's responsibility, you know, other than itself on sustainability? Is, 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 is that quite, I mean, for me, that the essence of, you know, what for me to take away to think about. So I guess like this has, I don't want to say subconsciously, but like because there are some new commission work that we are working with the artists on this exhibition as well. So that's why like, there are certain kind of uh, discussion or like uh, with the artists when we were, Billy and I was like discussing with the artists how actually the structure would be and how their artwork can be having this sustainable kind of angle to address as well as in like, for example, for Wing Ho So and also Dan Bok Ning and some uh, few more artists like were actually their prom or like they would be reusing some like material that they already invest or create in the first chapter and really evolve or transform it in the next chapter or in the subsequent third chapter as well. And actually it really reduce, I guess, like the additional material or other perspective in terms of meaning as well. And also it really make them think about in terms of creation. It is always not about individual work on its own, but how it makes a connection, how to make a series, how to make this dialogue in between these different phrases as well when people see it. So this is actually quite interesting for both me and Billy and also the artists in terms of this like sustainable like angle because I don't think we put exactly sustainable like word in, in our discussion when we talk about it but actually when we I think when we are thinking about oh do we add this element like do we like when the artist may be composing other elements as well like how do we respond to it as well I think yeah that that might have an impact on the decision making. Maybe we continue on this issue of sustainability because I'm not from an, any artistic background, so I'm more on the sustainability side. But my take on this is like sustainability should not be like something that is separate out as a focus. It should be basically embedded in everything you do. So, say for art show, we design the artwork itself and the message of those terms of, uh, to the like, um, to me. So, um, like on this, I'm just curious, like how essay as a community want to want to raise awareness to kind of like with this, um, this kind of message out to like other artists, maybe on the curator side, on the exhibitors, on how we arrange the logistics and also on the artist movements. Like, are there any, I'd say, um, maybe it's like more in a conceptual approach 
or at least like one of the people that would have played it, or in the calculations, I'm just curious how, what would you think should be uh, done to raise awareness on this? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I, 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 you know, one of the things that, you know, as soon as I finished that study, I realized that, you know, um, just me doing it is not enough. You know, I mean, you, you've got to have a, have a substantial amount of data, have a substantial amount of people buying, you know, prove that something that's not working and we'll try something else. Better. And that, for me, is, you know, I, I spent about a year trying to get the traction. You know, and and it, unfortunately, maybe it's just I was talking to the wrong people. It, but then I, 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 but then I simply, the more I think about it, the more I realize it's, it's the way you approach your thinking, you know. Um, and then I changed tack. I said, well, when I start talking to people, this is what I've done. What are you going to do? Because, because I'm not, you know, f you know, they could do something completely different. But it's it's just a way. Of, I don't, I don't mind, you know, if, if the narrative calls, you know, if the conversation says, the guy says, well, I don't agree with what you're doing. I'm going to do it like this. That's for me is perfect. It's, it's, it's really just getting to think, you know, because it's not one rule, because we were just talking about it earlier, you know, and there are a lot of architects here, you know, now, the, the, you know, the people are kind of blowing the trumpet about this is a platinum kind of um, standard, or, you know, sustainability and so on, but, but there's not one size fit all. I mean, these standards are reduced, but, you know, you've got buildings in Hong Kong which got bicycle racks in the basement, the movie cycles, and they get credit for it. And you kind of think, well, you know, you know, I think I think it's, it's a mindset thing, and 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 the figures I showed you. It's, it's, once you get to that point, it becomes meaningless. Because you know, I can't. You know, how can I measure something that you do very different than than can I do? Yeah, for, for me, it's it's multifaceted. It's like we can get together in a room and have a discussion and like share ideas. I think it's important to have numbers, like because you're able to quantify and you know and compare in that kind of sense. But also to, yeah, to somehow encourage people to be more exploratory. And I think, like one of the things that I liked from Signals was looking at a group of people who were talking basically about the same thing 60 years ago. And it's like they knew, you know, they're like, oh, if we keep consuming these things, if there's gonna be these problems, and. It's, we're having the same discussion now. Maybe we can quantify it more, and we have more of like, empirical evidence to support kind of the ideas that they're saying. But it's just about, for me, what yeah, what what I I learn from now, I take away is you know you you can think about these things in very abstract ways, in very creative ways, and experiment, and and then through a process of experimenting, maybe you can be doing something new. And I think that's maybe I don't know the best way to share that, but I think that for me that's the thing that yeah. I, like to share. And I know it's something that like, you know, Parasite's done this show and they want to let everyone know that they've done this show. So it's like, I don't think that's a good start. You know, like let other curators know when they think there's a sense, perhaps of peer pressure to some extent. And it's like, you know, they, they've seen what those guys have done and we're going to get called out for not doing this. And perhaps that's not a bad thing in, in some respects. So yeah, like having that discussion in the community. I think it's also, being on a slight detour maybe, but it, it's worth advocating for like a change of practices. I think one of the things that we've done here, which for me is very unusual, but has, I really appreciated the experience, is quite early when we were playing around with the experiments for the show. We kind of, well, oh, I kind of said to the guys like, we don't actually need a contract. Like, I built a few of these panels in this building downstairs by myself. Like, this is, there's no expert knowledge here. We don't need a, a particular set of skills. And so we didn't have a contractor. And, and that allowed us to really control the material process. So between me and the management team here, we ordered the materials ourselves. We collected them. We brought them to site. And for install, I work with a collection of art handles who the gallery works with on a regular basis to build all the panels and all the walls and to rearrange them. And, you know, as an architect, this isn't the usual situation where you do a drawing set and you give it to someone and you come and like, make sure it's done okay at the end. It's like really changing the way you work and like being there, drilling things and fitting things and like making sure it's built the way that you intended it to be built. 
And yeah, I think this is key for me. It's like changing the normal way of practice to address what we think is important. I mean, it, it's it. You see, this room here. Okay, third section. Give yourself a pat on the back because I mean, you're interested in the topic. You can get into hey, listen, whether you take something away, I don't know, but you, you, at least you're interested. The problem for us is that people are not here. The 7 million people, that minus 30, isn't it? You know, you, you, you're already halfway there because you're interested in something. Go and tell people who are not, you know, you know, I mean, that's a challenge. Yeah, that's what we're working on. That's why the this has been recorded and shared and well spread in order to reach wider audience who might not be able to make it today. But I really want to respond to that like change of practice and change of like really how we approach uh, exhibition making. It's like we sometimes easily like go back to our routine and like how to how to really break it down, like like break like break through that like usual practice and how do we get more hands on and be more like actively like talking to the stakeholders who might not understand like exactly quickly. For example, when we are talking to some handler or like worker, sometimes you really have to explain well, why we are doing this. Like they are not builder at the very first place. They are art handler and handling installation or etc. Why are we engaging them to do this? Like these needs a lot of like discussion, conversation to happen, and how this slowly will spread and really impact on people thinking. Like, as you just mentioned, we really want to reach out to more other art space, curator, art organizer, and beyond as well, in order to look into this and also discuss this further. This is not like the only method. Like, we are hoping that there are other module, ABC, this is A, there will be B, C, D, E, F, like numerous other design that could happen, that could adopt into these different spaces as well. And how do we make it happen? That is something that I guess like we must start from this group <laughs> and then we'll expand further after this. And I think like that is why like it's really in our DNA at Parasite as in we don't want to do things always uh, the same as well. We always want to really have this progressive thought and approach in really addressing what we haven't addressed now and how to fill in that gap in that discussion. So definitely this is not the end of the discussion. And I, I'm really hoping that there are these sustainable, let's say, guideline or environmental sustainable policy that can be addressed and maybe museum, gallery, website that people can take reference to. Like, of course, we are putting us out there if we are writing this policy, but then how to share this with others is very important. And I think there are some gallery or museum already doing that. So I'm trying, I will try to do that for Marissa as well <laughs> and maybe get some expertise from these people. But then like how to slowly really putting this out there and then this will be resources, reference point for people to really further the discussion and further the practice. So hopefully this circulation of knowledge and experience could keep on going and then it will lead us to a better world later. <laughs> so thank you so much for Joel and Roger and everyone in this room. And I just want to let everyone know that like, um, in the upcoming uh, August or September time, we will have another discussion with you and then we will announce it uh, later, uh, which will relate it to spatial design or expression making as well. So stay tuned and then hopefully I'll see you next time as well. Thank you.